This is the Sales Gravy Podcast. I'm Jeb Blunt, best-selling author of Fanatical Prospecting, Sales EQ, Objections, and Inked, and I'm here to help you open more doors, close bigger deals, and rock your commission check. Welcome back to another Sales Gravy Podcast. This episode is sponsored by my friends at Vidyard. It's my very favorite app for sending video messages to my prospects and clients. It's so easy. I just pick up my phone, I shoot a message, and I send it to them via email. And Vidyard works. It gets me indoors that that telephone and email and text messaging don't get me into because it turns me into a human being when I send a message to a prospect. And you can try Vidyard for free. In fact, you can get it for free for ever if you go to vidyard.salesgravy.com. That's vidyard.salesgravy.com and go download my favorite app. On this episode, I've got Frank Cespedes and Frank is like, this guy's brilliant. Okay. So let's just, let's just take a look at this for a second. He is a senior lecturer at Harvard. He has a PhD from Cornell. He went to MIT. So we just, we're just talking about smart, smart. And uh, he's worked with startups, corporations. He's been in the real world. He's been in the academic world. And he's got a brand new book called Sales Management That Works. And look, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm just impressed by this guy. And first of all, Frank, I've got a PhD too. My PhD is poor, hungry, and driven. So, so I'm like, I'm, I'm actually fascinated why someone with your pedigree and all of your degrees from Harvard would show up on my podcast because I grew up on a dirt road in Georgia, and I'm not even going to mention what my grade point average is at, at, the, at the really third tier college that I went to. Why, why here? Why now? Well, I mean, Jeb, a couple of things. First, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, for uh, hosting me on your podcast. I really do uh, appreciate it. I grew up working class New York, uh, you know, not, not, uh, not rural. Uh, and let me just say, I thank you for the introduction. In my case, flattery will get you everywhere, okay? <laughs> um, but you're basically asking why this book? Why this book about sales? And uh, I, I, it's a good question because it's not, uh, as you know, it's not like the world is waiting breathlessly for another book about sales. If you go to Amazon and click on books and in the keywords put in sales, out will come over 80,000 stock keeping units. Far as I can tell, the only management topic that gets more items in Amazon is, quote, leadership. It's about 90,000. But sales is a close second. Now, why, why this book? You know, the old aphorism, no single drop of rain ever feels responsible for the flood. Why contribute uh, to that monsoon? Two motivations. The first is once you get beyond the human basics, which are vital, sales is by far the most context-specific part of business. Selling software is different than selling capital goods is different than selling professional services. Selling multi-year license software is different than selling SaaS. Selling in North America is different than selling in Latin America, Asia, et cetera. And yet sales is that area where for some reason people feel most comfortable making these huge generalizations that are usually unsupported by any data beyond n equals one. You know, when I sold for Google, when we invested in PayPal, that kind of stuff. So, you know, after running a business, doing a lot of research in this area, I wanted to write a book that says, look, this is what research does and doesn't tell you about this core activity. I also think it's a particularly good time for a book like this. There is no doubt, and we may want to talk about this, there is no doubt that online technologies, the sustained data revolution that will continue throughout our lives, no doubt that that is changing buying and selling. But again, my sense of what I read about that is that people simply misunderstand the managerial implications and the realities of trying to do business development. So that's the motivation. You know, it's so an interesting thing when we put your six books together with with my 13 books, we have we have almost 19, almost 20 of the books all together between the two of us. And and, and I'm you know, I'm still writing. You're still writing. There's so much to write about. One of the things that you said that I think that's important for people to pay attention to is that 
sales as a profession defies black and white. And, and this is what I, and I, I'm glad that you said this because it's one of the things that I rail about with, especially people who have, you know, there's, there's an author, I had one sales job, I was good at it. Now this is the one and only way to sell. Are the pseudo gurus and experts that say, you know, follow my way, it's the one way to sell salvation. But sales doesn't work that way. And exactly what you said, there's all different shapes and sizes of sales, different markets, different people. And so what I what I really focus on as an author is probability, win probability that salespeople need to choose the technique, the the tool, the, the system that works best in their particular situation that's going to help them get their desired outcome. So I'm really about probability and choosing what works. And everything works, and that's that's the truth. Like you, I mean, you know, literally, we could uh, we could send snail mail. It, we probably wouldn't do a lot of it. We can sell snail mail, and we could sell things today. And prospecting would be really slow. But in some cases, with some markets, that's going to work. So, so first of all, I, I love the the start. There is not a one size fits all in sales. And the moron who is telling you this, usually on LinkedIn, that this is the only way, is a moron. Don't follow it. Just like the the other group of people who have from you know from the 1950s on been declaring that this and that in sales is dead. It's not dead. It's evolving. And something you said in the pre-show when we were talking is that the world is moving really fast and it's changing and the sales profession is changing with it. So let's start with, uh, with something that you talk about in the book around CEOs and uh, top executives in sales organizations. This isn't new, but it's interesting that we're still having this conversation where they sort of look at sales as something that's inside a black box, maybe even Pandora's box. Let's don't take the top off it. I really want to know what's going on in there. But they almost keep the sales organization at arm's length. Now, I want to juxtapose that because I work with a number of CEOs who don't. I work with a number of CEOs who came up through sales. They live in sales. They operate in sales. They show up on sales trainings. They meet every salesperson in their company. They, they see and understand that the sales organization is their lifeblood. It, the, the, those salespeople are essentially their elite athletes. But there's a whole other group of, of, of CEOs. And I would, I would I ask you to talk a little bit about startups, for example, engineers who then start a company and now they got to go sell stuff. That they, that they keep the salespeople there in that black box. Talk a little bit about that and what, let's, starting at top leadership, what top leadership should be doing differently in this yeah. fast changing, ever evolving world to truly leverage their sales organization to accelerate the growth of the company? Well, I think you're pointing to a, a number of important things. Let me, let me begin with um, the gap and the widening gap between the C-suite and uh, their customer-facing colleagues. And I think you'd agree with me, Jeb. I I frankly don't care whether we call the people responsible for business development sales associates or asparagus, but we're talking about bringing in that revenue. Now, there's a dirty secret in the Global 1000, and this is very good research. The number of reports to the CEO in the last 25 years has doubled two times. But now if you ask yourself, who were these people? Where did they come from? What were they doing before they became senior executives? The reality is that the vast majority of them are not general managers in the sense in which we teach that at Harvard Business School or that you experience. By a, a general manager, we typically mean someone running a line of business, someone with PL responsibilities. The vast majority of that doubling is specialists, the CIO, the uh, head of data, uh, legal. Now, why is that? It's not like companies wake up and say, wow, let's become siloed and bureaucratic. That'll be fun. The world is more complex. You do need more specialization in functions, including sales. But the reality, and this is also documented, fewer people than ever before have made it to the top without any prior sustained experience in customer acquisition. That's a big deal because one of their jobs in the C-suite is to create market relevant strategies. Tough to do that if you don't have that link. Now their job is not to run a sales force, all right? In fact, they'd probably be terrible at it, but their job is to know what questions to ask 
about their company's sales models and keep it up to date. The other element of your excellent question is the black box. And let me explain why it's been there and why that is changing. And this has significant implications uh, for um, sales careers. You know, people that quite, I hope, are watching sales gravy. The anecdote I'm about to tell you, I have experienced three times as a board member of companies. The sales leader has to make a presentation to the board does that, then the board goes into executive session, which as you know, is where they really talk. Three times the gist of that executive session talk has been, well, I'm not sure he really understood the question. I'm not sure she answered the issue. I'm not sure they get how we expect to increase enterprise value. But you know, Charlie, Charlotte makes their numbers every quarter, leave them alone. Those days are disappearing fast. And again, it has to do with the data revolution. Sales as a function is becoming more transparent to the rest of the organization. In fact, if you look, for example, in in, uh, uh, many tech startup businesses, the sales operations function, which is growing tremendously, more than 50% of the time, sales ops reports up through data, which reports into finance, not to the chief revenue officer. And as you know, Jeb, finance people are annoying. Once they get data, they start to ask questions. And that's what they do with the sales leaders. Well, how do you allocate this money? What is your cost to serve? I understand where you're telling me about top line motion. What about return on capital? The bottom line is that the requirements for financial literacy and sales are increasing significantly, and they will continue to increase. So there's a lot of things going on at once that makes our friends in sales a particularly vibrant area for change, and it affects individual careers. Interesting about the data and and how we're specialization. You know, specialization is basically moving into the C-suite and uh, and and in a, in a more acute way than it has in the past. Yeah. And so I run a, a relatively large training company in comparison to most training companies, and we work with a global who's who of organizations in pretty much on every continent except for Antarctica. And you may be surprised that the number one role that hires my company to come into an organization, either as a consulting or an advising role or as a sales training role, number one role, the CMO, the chief marketing officer. Because the chief marketing officer, because of the way data is being run, is being held accountable in a different way than they were before, because you can actually see every dollar they spend, you can see the ROI on that, and you can see the leads that they generate. And when the sales team isn't converting the leads, the CEO doesn't go to the sales leader, the CEO goes to the CMO and said, why am I spending millions of dollars if I'm not converting these into sales? So the CMO calls us in to then train the sales organization, which creates a whole lot of other bureaucratic problems for us and in political side of of things and and, in the corporate C-suite. But that's, that's a different motion than before where it used to be that the VP of sales would hire you to come into their sales kickoff meeting and you'd give a couple of speeches and move on. So, I, I, and I just had another conversation about this whole idea of specialization and experts rather than generalists, you know, managing another group of experts, especially when they don't actually share the same DNA, like financial people who are like in completely different, you know, atmosphere or environment of salespeople. So how does that work for sales leaders who find themselves? And and I would, you know, I know you're talking about, you know, Global 1000, but even go down to startups and small businesses where, you know, suddenly you're thrust in the role of leading a group of salespeople and you got no clue, like you've never really done it before. I mean, you might have been in customer acquisition, but you weren't on the street, you weren't on the telephones, you weren't being an SDR, you weren't an account executive, you weren't doing demos, but now you have a number you got to hit and you got to lead that group of people. And especially finance, you know, you think about the d- different quadrants of communication. We're, l- we're literally on opposite sides of the quadrants with sales and finance. How do leaders do this? Like, how do they manage? How do they coach? How do they lead? How do they, how do they go through those motions and build a successful sales team in this environment? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, just a couple of things, because I think you're pointing to a very important issue 
Uh, and there are reasons. It's important to understand the reasons why um, y- the, the necessity to work with people in other functions is in fact an increasingly big business development requirement. And again, it gets us back to online technologies data. The most important thing about selling is the buyer, not the seller. Who buys, why, and how? And as a general rule, technology is doing a couple of things. That's where it's having its biggest impact. You know, as you know, Jeb, we typically talk in sales about the sales funnel, that linear process. That's decreasingly true of most buying journeys in most markets. The buyer is online and offline at multiple times. Technology allows them to contact different functions in the prospective vendor. As a result, that makes sales more dependent on cross-functional collaboration. The dialogue you're talking about between marketing and sales, sales and finance, et cetera. And the reason for that, and here I will date myself, Jeb, but the reason for that is what I call the Ghostbusters reason. Remember that wonderful film? Remember the, the um, uh, you know, when, when you see a ghost, who are you going to call? Well, what the research tells us is 80 plus percent of the time, when the buyer has an issue with the product or service, they call the person who sold it to them. And that person, doesn't matter what the heck their job description says, that person now needs to become the de facto systems integrator in their company. And even small companies, I, you know, I work with lots and lots of startups, even small companies become <laughs> siloed much quicker than anyone can imagine As a result, those things are very, very important. It also affects the particular relationship you're talking about, and that is marketing and sales. Now, why do you get the call from the CMO? I would argue for a couple of reasons. What's the standard thing you hear from salespeople when they're not making the numbers? Well, the leads are not good, all right? So that's what the CEO hears calls marketing. Secondly, in general, in all businesses, metrics are kinder to sales than they are to marketing because sales is the ultimate performance art in business. You did or didn't make the sale. You did or didn't close. That, that's a pretty firm number. Marketing with brand awareness and other things, it's always harder to demonstrate that impact. And as a general rule, now again, a general rule in a world of many, many exceptions, One of the things technology is doing is allowing sales to do things that as recently as a decade ago would clearly have been in marketing's domain. Good example of that are SaaS businesses, lead gen. A lot of that uh, uh, inbound marketing is now handled by sales. And the issue quite, you know, uh, honestly, Jeb, is whether the salespeople know how to do that. There was a reason that we had marketing folks. <laughs> well, I think you got to blend there because, for example, in my company, and we're a small company, but we're in in the in the scope of a training companies in the sales space. We're we're relatively large, uh, and but we've worked very very hard to make our entire team a lead generation organization. So we have a marketing function, but we're but the marketing function is sort of building the lead captures, but teaching our team in mass to leverage things like LinkedIn, and we're able to every week and we measure everything every single week. In fact, every day we're looking at the numbers, but we manage every week to produce about three hundred really good leads. And all I need is about five, right? I need about five a week and I'm, I'm golden. But we, we, we produce about 300 leads a week organically without spending a dime on advertising by being able to leverage the sales team. And I think more organizations are waking up to that. It's a, it, there's a lot of coaching. There's a lot of leadership. There's a lot of inspiring, you know, because you're asking people to, to you're asking these salespeople in particular to, I want you to hang out on, on LinkedIn for just long enough to help generate a lead, but then I need you to go back to having conversations with people. It's about talking with people. So, so I think that, I think you, you are running into that and there, and there is a leadership function to this. I mean, along with technology, you know, we still, we're, 
gosh, we're you know 30 years into the CRM revolution. And my first move this morning was a was an email out to my entire team that says, folks, we're getting a little bit off track. We're not using this tool. We use HubSpot. We love HubSpot. It's a fantastic uh, tool. And it's the easiest CRM I've ever used in my entire life. But I got salespeople and I've got operations people and I've got my account managers who are essentially my trainers. So they manage the accounts. We're not using it right. So we got to get them back on track with using the technology that's coming at them. Um, let me real quickly shift gears uh, from technology to humans. So there's a couple of things that that I'm I'm running into with some of my larger clients that is a, a little bit concerning, but I, I and I want you to talk a little bit about models and processes. So you were talking about linear process doesn't matter as much. I may disagree with you a little bit on that because I believe that uh, that it's our job in sales to bend buyers back to the process to create leverage. And the reason that I want to create leverage is that by creating leverage or using my leverage to do that and have an opportunity to do my job, which is build the relationship and neutralize or eliminate their perceived alternatives and not doing business with me. And I can't do that on the buyer's schedule. If the buyer says, this is how I want to buy and I sell the way the buyer wants to buy, I'm, I'm basically being leveraged out of, uh, out of any strength at the, at the table. So, but one of the things I've noticed with companies is that they almost all have a process or a model, but the process or model is functioning on these really big phases. For example, um, you know, you have the phase, I got one, you know, one phase client recently, a work in progress, like that's their phase. And, and what I'm not seeing is the coaching below the phase. So the phase is in their Salesforce database or in HubSpot or pipeline or whatever discovery. But the coaching that goes below that to, to think about the micro steps. So, so the micro steps may be I've got multiple stakeholders that I've got to spend time with and I've got to get financial buy off of my own organization. So there's internal steps I have to I have to jump through, especially at the enterprise and national account and complex level where there's a lot of risk. The organization, you got to do those things before you can go do this. And the, and the leadership team is just fixated on getting a report that says, I've got this many deals in discovery, which really doesn't mean anything unless we're, unless we're measuring all those micro commitments. And Frank, I'm going to give you one more piece of this, just, and I'm going let to you, let you run with it. I was just having this conversation with one of my clients uh, in the manufacturing space, and we were I was getting them below the surface, breaking down all the micro commitments inside their big phases in their Salesforce database. And I started asking questions about it, and um, and in the process, just I'm just asking questions. Uh, one of the, the the vice presidents just says something about they bringing people in to do a demo. I said, really, bringing people to do a demo? He goes, yeah, because they sell these big machines, and, they, and we're talking about million dollar machines. But if we can get them to come in and do a demo, he goes, we close them. I said, like like how many? Like what's your close rate on that? And he says, well, the close rate on after the demo is about 80%. So if we get them to do a demo, we got about 80% probability they're going to buy after they do that. And I said, okay, well, that makes sense to me. And part of that is the investment effect, right? So if they have to come and do the demo, then they're investing in the process, which means from a human standpoint, they're more likely to see it through to an outcome. Uh, so I said, okay, well, that's great. So we're, we've got all the data out. I said, so right now when your pipeline, your forecast, these are the deals you're forecasting. So you're giving it to the CEO and the board. We're going we're gonna to hit these numbers. How many of the deals the, 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 that are in your forecast that you were forecasting to close this quarter have done a demo? And the number was less than 5%. So they know data-wise that the micro step of a demo gives them an 80% probability of closing the deal. This is what I mean about probability, right? But less than 5% of the deals that they were forecasting to the board that they were going to close had been through that step. And, and if you just look back at their missed forecast, they were missing forecast every single quarter, which is why yours truly was there because the CEO called and said, hey, can you help me figure this out? And when I looked at the whole thing, I'm like, you're, you're, you're so focused on where the thing is and you're assigning a probability, like really a probability. You're saying if it's here, we got this, it's, you know, we're, we're going to forecast it, but it had nothing to do with any reality. So the model needed to go a little bit lower and deeper. And that's a sales leadership thing. Like that's, that, those are the things that sales managers traditionally did. And it's not happening. And I see this, I'm seeing this everywhere. Like this is, this is an, an, like I'm talking about a you pick an industry 
And I'll tell you, they're focusing on a phase in the CRM, not the micro steps that actually lead to a deal being closed. So I'm going to leave you with that. I just I threw up all over you, Frank. But <laughs> but you got a but dude, you got a PhD, okay? So you should be able to handle that, process it, and say something that is incredible and uh, and and insightful based on all of that junk I just threw at you. Well, let me give it a shot because I think you're um, uh, I think you're you're right. You're you're raising a number of issues, but they're all very important. And by the way, I agree with you. I think these are increasingly common issues. Now, the first, let's just get to process. Um, process is very, very important in business. It's very difficult to scale without some replicable process in sales business development, because otherwise you're simply dependent on individual heroic acts in the field. And that's very tough to scale. But process is also, I think you'd agree with me, Jeb, one of the sloppier used words in the business vocabulary. Um, what you and I mean by process is exactly what you're talking about, what you called the micro commitments. In other words, when you say to that CEO in effect, look, from the time you call someone a lead to the time they close or don't close, do you and your people actually understand what drives what? What does get them to a demo? What does distinguish that uh, 80% from 20%, et cetera. That's what I call a process. But I think many, many executives, including sales leaders, confuse what you and I mean by a process with two other things. One is sales methodology. That's not the same thing. Methodologies have their place. But again, most important thing about sales is the buyer. And I always quote someone said this to me in one of the earlier case studies I wrote when I was a junior professor and I actually had hair. He said, you know, Frank, if all customers sound the same to you, don't try to make a living in sales. Be a plumber. You'll make more money, right? I mean, that's the issue. Salespeople have to adapt to those buyers. Uh, and that very often goes beyond any particular methodology. I think if I can say so, I think what you do at Sales Gravy is very wise that way because you're focusing on basics that are gonna be relevant across, as opposed to some training firms that say, our methodology works everywhere. Not true, simply not true. Mm -hmm. The other thing that uh, many leaders and sales leaders confuse with a process, you've already pointed to it, is the CRM system, right? Why are CRM systems been around 30 years and uh, we still, you know, the, 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 uh, who, who wakes up in the morning and says, oh, my CRM system, thank God, right? For one thing, think about the inputs to a CRM system. Most salespeople, that's not their priority number one. So you always got to, you know, jump on them to even input data. Right. And secondly, look at the way they work. Right. I call a lead anybody I happen to call with an email this morning. You call a lead somebody who calls back. Most CRM systems is the aggregate throughout those phases of all of those individual, very subjective and inconsistent judgments. And then the third issue, and I think this is vital to establishing a process and even having a shot at getting real data, as opposed to what I call data theater that comes out of CRM systems. And let's get back to your very, very good comment, because I see this example you cited again and again, it's especially relevant to small businesses and um, uh, startup businesses. Your point was, what was the percentage that we, um, we get to demo? Basically 5%, one out of 20. It's not only the expense of doing that, that's a dead weight loss to the business, the other 19 that never get there. Now, what's the cause of that? The cause is, is an absence of relevant and valid lead qualification criteria. And one of the things you see again and again, and again, it's driven because customers, it's so much easier for them to search what happens in companies that don't understand process the way you're talking about it is that the sales organization lets in to the business, into the prospecting, a whole variety of companies. 
And in fact, the cost of those false positives killed the business. Now, getting back to something I said earlier, this is one of the areas where the finance people know what they're talking about. And increasingly, they're the hawks here. But the way you deal with that, in my opinion, is not by expanding or making easier to use the CRM system, et cetera. It's by getting clear what are the criteria that says this is or is not within our scope, within our kind of customer. And I would argue that's what you're doing at Sales Gravy when you get the marketing, the sales, and the other people you know, to, to sort of talk about this. Yeah, we use a, a methodology, we call it a nine box just because one of our clients call it that, but it's a nine frame matrix. And uh, on one side is uh, high potential, middle potential, low potential. So we just segment that way. Across the top is technical qualifiers, uh, stakeholder qualifiers, so the human qualifiers and fit qualifiers. Does it fit the organization? And each of the boxes is independent of the other boxes. So we'll sit down with, with, uh, with a sales team and basically say, okay, let's just define these things. What are the bullet points that would say this is a high potential prospect in technical data? So technical would be how much, how many, that type of things, anything you can measure. Uh, what would be high potential in, in say, stakeholder? Well, I'm meeting with the CEO or we have the CIO involved or we've got a committee of people that have been assigned to this. What about fit? So fit would be, do they fit your organization? And so we'll build all that out and then we'll take a pipeline and we'll say, okay, let's take a, a deal that you have in your pipeline that you forecasted. Now, let me give you, I'm going to give you three, I'll, I'll actually draw this on a board and I'll say, here's three sticky notes. Put the sticky notes in the quadrant or in, you know, in the box that fits this particular, uh, this particular uh, a prospect or, or deal list in your pipeline. And it's incredible when we start doing this. I did this uh, right before the pandemic. I was in Shanghai, China with a group of, of, uh, of Chinese sales professionals that were working for a global um, you know, multinational company. And we were doing this with our forecasts. Again, same thing. They're missing forecasts consistently. They've got packed full pipelines, pipelines full of stuff. They're telling the leadership team, they're telling operations, they're telling finance, it's going to close, it's going to close, it's going to close. These, by the way, are big multi-million dollar deals. And so we start doing this. And as we start going through it, if you look at the thing, you know, just look at where the where the things you know end up. So if you've got uh, you know, like in you know your your uh, low potential, if you've got a, a sticky note at the bottom of that in fit, you're it's not the right deal for you. The finance people are going, why are you bringing me stuff that's not going to make any profit or something that I'm not going to be able to retain over time because they don't fit our model, they don't fit our culture, whatever the case may be. So as we went through this with this with this group of Chinese salespeople, what we found was almost 90% of their pipeline was bogus. What we're, we're, I'm talking about their forecasting. And the reason why was it was all focused on technical. Technical was how many, like how many people work there? You know, how, how big is their building? How big are their facilities? The problem was, as we got in the fit category, all of the, the the prospects, almost all the prospects that were in their in their forecast, were Chinese owned companies. They were like you know the Bank of China. Right? I mean, so this is a multinational company based in the U.S. selling into China. Yeah. Chinese owned companies aren't going to do business with them. I mean, that's just you know it's yeah. it's the same thing here. You know, our government's probably not going to do business with a company from France when you can do a company from the U.S. So, so they were working on really, really big deals because that's what the leadership told them to work on. But to your point, none of it was going to close ever, yeah. ever. And oh, by the way, when we looked at stakeholders, they weren't meeting at the top levels of the organization. They were meeting with middle management. Middle management was happy to have a conversation with them and talk with them because they were bringing free lunch. Yeah. So they would keep showing up and having a conversation. So I do believe that you're exactly right. I think that I think that there's no perfect, right? So everybody wants the ideal, this is like the big deal. I want the ideal qualified prospect. Well, it's not perfect. In the real world, you're gonna get a few unicorns where everything lines up across the top line. But in most cases, we gotta start making judgment calls about what we're, what we're calling on. But here's my question to you on all of that. So dropping that in your lap. When I came up in sales, I worked for brilliant sales leaders, brilliant. And I call them, you know, the old guard. Like these are the guys that would kick your rear end, uh, but they were 
beautiful strategist. They would, you know, we would like as you, we would go through like murder boarding sessions where you would take the deals that you were forecasting and we would find every way possible to kill them until you were completely embarrassed and bloodied on the floor. But when you walked out of there, you were either going to go close the deal or you were going to get it out of your pipeline. But that's how we worked on things. I'm it's missing and I'm and I'm seeing it missing in a lot of places, not everywhere. I, I, there's some great sales managers out there and I don't want to disparage sales leadership in general. But but I'm seeing that type of sales leader missing. It's good for my business. Don't get me wrong. I like it because it gives us a lot of work. But I, I hurt because I just don't feel like the kind of conversation I'm having with you, that's the conversation that sales leaders should be having with their salespeople. And I don't even believe that they understand how to get there. And I think part of the reason is data. People are so focused on the size of the pipeline, right? I've got to have four, four times pipe or five times pipe that they're not even focused on the fact that almost everything in the pipe is a pipe dream and not actually going to turn into anything. So you're incentivizing salespeople to lie in the CRM. You're incentivizing sales leaders to sort of look beyond what they know is a, you know, a piece of crap. And no one's really teaching salespeople how to be... Uh, insightful and thoughtful and even a little bit of introspective about the deals that they're they're going to spend their time on uh you know in the pipeline and the fr and frankly the fact that the the you know marketing has gotten so good at generating leads you really shouldn't have salespeople who are having a hard time doing that because there's always something new walking through the, the door so uh, what do you, i mean what what are your thoughts on that is it does it am i wrong about it you know or are, are you seeing the same well, thing yeah, and what yeah. needs to happen I wouldn't say you're wrong, Jeb, but I think you're, if I can say so, I think you're a little too young to start talking about the good old days, right? <laughs> uh, I think we still, you know, human, one of the great things about humans is they, talent comes in all shapes and sizes. And I think you've got a lot of still good sales leaders and a lot of bozos. And by the way, that was true when you were carrying the bag. Right? I agree with that. Number you're one. right. Where, where I do think you're onto something real, and you know, my book talks about this and I can only see it increasing, again, that data revolution, that data is there. And what that does in many, many leadership positions, not only sales, but especially in sales, because in sales, sales by its very nature generates so much data, it gets the leader looking at what I call interesting but marginal factoids as opposed to in an, insert, an uncertain world, those handful of things, and there typically are a handful, that are gonna make a difference in generating or not the micro commitments, et cetera. So I do think data is uh, increasing that fallacy for folks that are either learning how to be leaders or you know, don't have it. The other thing I would say, however, you know, what made those leaders good? I think you pointed to them. And one is they understand incentives. Let's get back to your, your example from the Chinese company. 90% of those leads are basically bogus leads, all right? Now, why is that? In their case, it may be because, hey, this is how we grow up, and my cousin knows the brother of the minister at the Politburo. But in, let's look at US companies. It's a sales compensation issue. The, the data I'm about to cite to you has been remarkably consistent throughout my career. I'm going to use jargon they used to use at IBM, all right? At IBM, when you uh, sort of uh, maxed out on your incentive comp, you know, the variable pay comp, they would say about that salesperson that he or she, quote, hit big casino, all right? Okay. And um, if you ask yourself, in most sales organizations, what's required to hit big casino, the answer is actually very simple. The, the answer is top line volume, not cost of sale, not profitability of sale, not return on capital, simply top line volume, meaning the bigger deal is better. Now, in a sales comp plan like that, and sales reps, as you know, understand their comp plan very, very well. In a plan like that, there is no such thing as a bad customer. So 
what am you know? Once I get outside the, the training program or or the offsite, what am I going to do? I'm going to let a lot in because if I close a sale, it's your problem, not mine, to figure out how to make that a profitable customer. So I think that's one of the reasons for all those false positives. The other thing, and this is what you're doing, and what you did in effect in the example you gave, in order to make this stick beyond the whiteboarding and do we put them in this quadrant or that quadrant, there are typically two very, very important processes. And this is, I think, core to developing sales leaders. One is performance management, performance reviews, right? Talk to HR people. They will constantly bemoan what I call drive-by reviews by busy sales managers that are not really about performance, but about compensation. So much of the important information in an uncertain world for deciding what is in and what is outside scope only gets lodged up here, not in the sale, not in the CRM system. It only becomes apparent through a good performance review. And by the way, this is a trainable skill. This is not metaphysics. Company I ran, I waited four years to bring in, you know, company like yours to really teach us about this. I, that was four years too late. All right, there's, there's no excuse for this. The other thing is what you were doing with that company and asking about the deals. You know, what traditionally in sales we call win-loss analyses or what in other functions they call after-action reviews. Those are vital and they do get neglected. So I don't think that, um, you know, I don't think that, you know, these kids today don't get it the way uh, they did years ago. I think, I think that bell curve of talent was true then is true now, but I do think the prevalence of data is generating, again, interesting but marginal factoids, a lot of noise. And I think there are certain real core elements of leadership in sales, win-loss analyses, the ability to do good performance reviews, as well as all the motivational stuff we always talk about. Those are things that, that may not be getting the attention they deserve. I agree with you. I think you're right on that, and I think that's I think that's fair to you know to to look at the world that way. When we when we think about selling, and and I, this was the last question on data before we get into a little bit more human, and I start thinking about forecasting. What I notice in organizations, and this is just me, okay. So I get pulled in, and I'm usually when I'm there, I'm tearing everything apart. And and one of the big issues for C level leaders is the the forecasts keep getting missed. Right? We miss forecasts. We miss forecasts. We miss forecasts. When I'm teaching leaders, I always ask them, "What is your most valued ability as a leader?" And they give me this whole list of things, usually human things. And I look at them and go, "None of the above." Your most valuable ability, most valued ability as a leader is the ability to predict the future. That is to be able to tell the organization, this is what's going to happen this quarter at the end of the quarter. And by the way, same for CEOs. When you're, you know, when you go out and you have your, you know, your uh, quarterly call with all the analysts, when you say we're going to hit this, if you hit it, your stock goes up. If you miss it, even on the upside, your stock can go down because now people don't trust you. So forecasting is part of that trust. Sales leaders are asked to forecast. And in, when I'm teaching sales leaders, I'm like, don't ask your, your salespeople what the forecast is going to be because they're going to lie to you. Because it's like you talk about incentives. It's, it's in their best interest to tell you a lie because when they tell you a lie, you go, oh, nice job. But then you find out after the fact that you didn't make it. And as you said, and I think this is really, really insightful, because we don't really stick to AARs, like we never do the after action review, then what happens is that there's never really even a penalty for anybody for missing forecasts, except for the CEOs are mad the entire time because they're missing everything. So when I'm teaching people to do forecasts, and this is really a, this is a wonky question, and I'm, I'm truly interested in what your take on this is. Here's my methodology. My methodology is this. First, you have to assign a accurate win probability to every deal. And that win probability is not whatever number your finance team or anybody else put on that stage in the CRM. So if you say it's in discovery and it's hit 40%, that's a lie. 
you have to get in that salesperson's face, you have to be doing pipeline reviews, and you have to ask questions, hard questions. And you said this earlier, you said it's really about the learning the questions to ask. So you got to ask hard questions to understand working with that salesperson, what is the most accurate probability based on all the patterns that you see, all the history, all of your experience that this deal is going to advance to close, number one. Number two is accurate revenue. And salespeople, again, salesperson says, oh, it's going to be a million dollars, and it's really going to be $250,000. But if they say it's a million dollars, everybody pats them on the back. They give them a lot of resources. So you're incentivizing the person. What is the actual number? So what's that number? And the time frame that it's going to close. Salespeople will tell you it's going to close this month, and it's going to close nine months from now. So finding out what that's going to be. So what you've got to do is then take a look at the quarter and say, what's the probability that this deal will close inside this time frame at this amount of revenue? And if you get that accurate, all you have to do is multiply your probability, which is a percentage or it's a decimal, times the revenue, and that should give you an accurate forecast going forward. The problem with this for sales leaders is it actually means that you have to get into the pipeline and get your head out of the data. Like You have to actually be there and be a part of it. It's incredibly accurate. It works. This is the methodology we use in our company. And it's, it's, I mean, it's measurable, you know, and the delta is very, very small when you're doing it right. As soon as you take your eye off the ball, it gets bad. But that goes back to that shallow, um, I, I can't remember the word you, you said for it, but it was beautiful. The shallow data is it's so much easier for everybody to go, well, the CRM says it's 40%. The salesperson reports it a million dollars. So salesperson says it's going to close. So let's put it in the forecast. And, and nobody has to do any work. So I'm just interested in your take when you're working with, you know, with, with your clients and CEOs. And when you're, you know, you're teaching in the classroom, what's the, what's the process or what's the methodology or the formula that you feel like works the best for getting accurate forecasts? Yeah. I mean, well, let me just say the the bottom line of my answer to your question, Jeb, is I fundamentally agree with the process that you just outlined. And I think you would agree that one of the secrets to making that work is not just, okay, give me a, give me a probability estimate, you know, pluck it out of the air. But one of the secrets to making it work is that, A, it's done on an iterative basis. We don't do it once and then, as they say in New York, forget about it. We're doing it constantly. And suddenly, we have some basis, some rationale, some set of questions that we can ask when you ask me the probability and I say 80%. But why 80, not this, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Now, two other things I want to add to this, because they add to what I think is at the heart of this, and that is ultimately in sales managers must manage on an ongoing basis. Why is the most common complaint from CEOs about sales? They didn't make their forecasts, right? Look, you know, there's one easy glib answer. If you really wanted sales to always make its forecasts, just lowball the forecasts. And by the way, we've actually had sales trainers who get paid a lot in motivational speeches, and this is their message to the sales force, lowball the forecast. I'm, I'm not sure why anybody would pay someone to come in and say that to their reps, but you know, that's the easy answer. The reason this is such a big issue and getting bigger, in the vast, vast majority of businesses, so many other resource allocations in operations, uh, technology, manufacturing, after-sales service, so many other resource allocations there depend on the forecasts and sales ability to meet the forecast. And then the other thing is true, this is an area, sales, that's ultimately dependent on an uncertain, unmanageable external environment. Think about what's going on today. Neither you nor I caused the pandemic, neither you nor I had anything to do with the Delta variants. Somebody made a forecast three months ago when everything looked great that may or may not hold today. So the expectation of accuracy has to be tempered and you need other processes in place for that, right? That's why the iterative process is so important and a common understanding of what does and doesn't qualify as a Mm -hmm. good answer when I ask you about that probability. And you, you don't get that, I think, 
Simply through asking, you get that through ongoing performance reviews, win-loss analyses, after-action reviews, mm -hmm. sitting down, et cetera. That, that's where people yeah. have to and it's you know, and, and I, I agree with you. I think it, I love the iterative. You're, it's got to be an always on thing. Some of it is if you're a you know, I say young, but if you're a you know, if you're relatively new in sales leadership, sometimes you just don't have the experience to see the patterns when someone's lying to you. And I'm not saying that salespeople lie intentionally; they just lie because we reward them for lying to us. I mean, we, it's 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 just a thing that we do. So so it does take time, and it's through the performance reviews, through the after action reviews, through all those things that you begin to see. Hey, I asked that question, and you know, I could see the look on their face, and I, I'm not satisfied. Let me ask a deeper question because sometimes I'm asking the question, they'll tell me that I'll go, you know what? I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night, and we're not putting forty percent on this thing. It's got two percent. You make the case for me why it's going, why it's better than that, and you know, and then and so now I, I challenge my salespeople to defend their deals, which makes them better because they're thinking about it. So I think uh, I think you're right on the money. I would just add something to that because and it may be a segue to the people questions you want to ask. Look, any leader in any function has to be worthy of being followed. A lot of sales leaders in particular ask those questions as a way of either playing gotcha or, okay, you better, you better deliver or that's it, as opposed to what you're quite rightly pointing. This is going to make us all better. I'm here to help you make more money by doing that. So, I mean, that, that's what le good leaders do. And, and it's not just in sales. It's across the board. You know, there's a famous article by a former colleague of mine about the capital budgeting process in companies, and it's called paying people to lie. The same thing goes on in those bigger numbers in companies, but good leaders are able to cut through that thicket and establish the culture that has that genuine dialogue. I love that, paying people to, to, to lie. Okay, I'm gonna drop a line on you. And this is a line when I'm, when I'm asked to come in and give keynote speeches or spend time with, uh, with with executive CEOs, what I say to them is is this: the greatest threat to your company are not your competitors, not the marketplace, not the changes. The greatest threat to your company is how your sales people choose to spend their time. Go. Yeah. No, I mean, in fact, uh, I didn't realize you said this, but you'll see that that's uh, one of the uh, things in my book. In fact in a Harvard Business Review article that I, um, uh, I recently published. Um, let's start at the top. What, again, one of the core things that, that senior leadership teams are responsible for is crafting market relevant strategies. I mean, the reality is that it's very tough to get sustained good things done in business without a coherent strategy. You cannot substitute even the most effective sales process for a bad strategy. It doesn't work that way. It works the other way around. Now, I'm going to get academic with you for a moment, but bear with me. I think one of the uh, handy ways to think about strategies, it always has three components. At a minimum, any coherent strategy has three components. One is objectives. What are we trying to accomplish, both quantitatively and qualitatively in terms of the brand, positioning, et cetera? The second is what the strategists call scope. Where do we play? Where don't we play? And then the third is advantage. In the areas where we choose to play, what gives us you know, an unfair advantage of some sort? Now let's talk about scope. And this is my, what I always say to senior leaders. Scope decisions in strategy are not set by a couple of senior people getting off in a room and talking about it. That's called brainstorming. That's not called strategy. In reality, in any business, scope, where we play and where we don't play, is set by the aggregate call patterns of your sales force, where they are spending time and attention. And notice the inevitability, not probability, the inevitability of opportunity costs in that area. Time, money, effort spent on account A or prospect A is time, money, and effort not available for accounts B, C, D, et cetera. Do you, senior executive, have any idea what your compensation and incentives and performance management practices mean 
for the call patterns in your sales force. That I think is the issue. And unfortunately the answer there is very often, no, I don't, but I'll find out, or B, something so abstract that has no real relationship to affecting human behavior. Well, I, and, and I think when you talk about human behavior, and, and I guess this will be our last uh, uh, subject or last prompt here, but you say that salespeople are only spending about a third of their time actually doing selling stuff. And for me, selling stuff is having conversations with people. Yeah. And it's talking with people. That's what we get paid to do. If if people don't need to, if you don't need to have conversations with customers, that means the customer can go to your website, click a button and buy whatever they want. And they really don't need a salesperson to intervene to increase the probability that your company wins the deal versus a competitor. That's that would be marketing's job. And that's what I explain to salespeople. If 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 the sell if the if your client can just go there, we don't need you. And and what I've noticed that there are really two things that are driving less time spending with people having conversations, impacting their motivation to do business with your employer. Uh, and that is asynchronous salespeople who are doing nothing but sending emails and direct messages, but they're, they're basically keeping people at arm's length and they're trying to just email their way to prosperity. And then a confusion, and this can be scope and market on what their job actually is. Like, what 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 am I supposed to be doing? Now, some of that's natural. We've been fighting with that for years, which is you have a hunter salesperson in an account manager role where you're asking the person to go out and take care of existing accounts and go sell new accounts, a very hard thing to do. Um, and so, or you've got account managers who are supposed to be expanding accounts, but you want them to go get new accounts. So you haven't specialized your roles well enough. Some of it's just because companies are pouring non-sales activity on their salespeople. Some of it's because you've got leadership that doesn't really direct the salespeople. Here's what I want you to be doing every single day. Uh, some of it's the data that gets in the way because they're putting things into systems or what have you. But I want to end with this because it's it's the the core value of a sales organization is its ability to help customers buy things that they feel unsure about buying on their own. Like so I'm influencing that and I'm I'm motivating individual stakeholders to want to do business with both me and my company. I'm using leverage to to have the opportunity to do deeper discovery and ask questions to eliminate the alternatives, one of which is to do nothing. Uh, and I'm able to create and build um, a uh, a picture of what the future can look like by creating solutions and being a consultant and doing things that salespeople do. That is a human endeavor. Now it's changed in the pandemic. We're blending multiple communication channels, but that's okay because in a lot of cases it makes us more efficient and effective and working with clients because we there's all kinds of different ways that we can have synchronous conversations. But I just want you to just end with. Um, with talking about what leaders need to be doing in order to get their salespeople spending more time having actual conversations with the people that the company wants to 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 acquire as customers. Yeah, no, very very good, uh, and it, it, you'll see that my response gets us back to your first topic because they're they're linked. I take three things about this. First, you're exactly right, and I don't think this is just the pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated this. But this is a long-term trend. That figure you see in my uh, book is, a, is actually an optimistic figure. There are other bits of research that say it's 25%, not even 30% or, or 20%. The first thing is to recognize why this happens. You, you by the way, and I, I want to give you kudos for this, excellent, excellent podcast you did a while ago you know, hey, I called 40 times. How come I didn't get a response? I think you diagnosed that very well. Persistence counts in sales, but it's harder and harder because of technology. Prospects and buyers are bombarded with this. It is simply harder to get access, not just because they're not in the office because of COVID, a long-term trend. The second thing is to recognize what this means, not only for sales productivity, but for the business, think about SMBs. Let's accept the, uh, the figure about 30% of the average rep's time is spent in customer contact. Imagine if you can make that 35%, 40%, nirvana, you know, 50%. Not only is that in most businesses a huge productivity increase in sales, it also increases the, the addressable market of the business. 
because segments that were uneconomic to reach now are economically feasible. That's why sales and leadership need that dialogue. Now, the third issue is why does it happen? I think you went through the relevant laundry list for this. How do you fix it? I would start with a couple of areas. One is getting back to something you said right at the beginning of our conversation, Jeb. I need to understand cause and effect. That's what in my book I call the customer conversion dynamic. I need to know what drives what in making those micro commitments. And then I want to put my good people on those areas where they make a difference. And where they don't make a difference, why am I putting them there? Why don't I use marketing or service or, for that matter, an algorithm, right? Some some machine. That's number one. But it also gets us back to the links between hiring and deployment, which most sales leaders, because they are under short-term pressures, don't spend enough time with. When you ask sales leaders, who are you looking to hire? What I have found throughout my career is if you take seriously what they say, nobody except Michael Jordan or Leonardo da Vinci is going to fulfill those criteria. And my advice is, look, whenever you can order, whenever you can hire Jordan or da Vinci, you know, do it. They'll they'll make the basket. They'll do a great job uh, with the Last Supper. But there are very few Renaissance men and women out there. This is where deployment affects hiring, affects productivity. If I understand what drives the micro commitments, I then can deploy my reps where they make a difference. And it turns out that increases my talent pool, increases the customer contact time, and means that I can do what Peter Drucker decades ago defined as his core requirement of leadership, getting ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You know, when I can get Da Vinci, do it, but Leo is Leo's really expensive and, he, and he's not he's not available 24-7. Um, that's that's how I'd answer your question, Jim. Beautiful. Excellent. All right, Frank. So thank you so much for being on the Sales Gravy Podcast. This was a fascinating conversation. I really, really enjoyed this. Um, you are uh, you are in a, 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 a an amazing human being and people should pay attention to you. Let's start here. Tell people about your book real quickly and where they can pick up your book. And uh, and then if people want to connect with you after the podcast, how should they do that? Well, I mean, you can get the book um, uh, through all the standard ways. You can go to Amazon, goodreads.com, your, your favorite bookseller. You can contact the publisher directly, Harvard Business Review Press. Uh, they offer volume discounts. I mean, I think you should buy a couple of hundred copies for the sales force and for your children. It'll make a great Christmas gift. They also do a clever thing in customizing and co-branding their books. You may want to look at that. Uh, then in terms of contacting me, uh, look, I'm a professor at Harvard Business School. You know, there's whatever they do with the faculty page, LinkedIn, all the other standard areas. Perfect. Awesome. So tell us the name of the book one more time so people can hear the name one more time. Sales Management That Works, How to Sell in a World That Never Stops Changing. And by the way, we came up with that title before the pandemic. I love it. Very good. Frank, thank you so much for being on the Sales Gravy Podcast. And don't forget, if you want to download my very favorite app, it's an app that I use to get in more doors. It, it just it personalizes prospecting. Go check out Vidyard. You can get the app and you can sign up for free. And it's free, free, free forever at vidyard.salesgravy.com. That is vidyard.salesgravy.com. See you next time on the Sales Gravy Podcast.